markets. And you're talking to people like James Tavernier, Connor Goldston, Laura Varisic, they're top, top players, you know, all the legend, um, legend in Rangers and uh, famous. So you'd have man-to-man conversations and, and they would discuss areas and you would show them. And in the end, they're going out and they're agreeing before they've even gone out. Let's not forget Celtic have won three trebles. So they're a good side. Uh, and it was always going to take some time to bridge that gap and overtake it and sustain success. So I think that way from Arsenal, I think if I could take anything from him, is his belief in the work that he did um, and also his patience with developing young players. Neil, welcome to the podcast. I want to begin by starting at the very early stages of your journey. How did football become part of your life? Well, Chrissy, thanks for inviting me on to your podcast. Uh, straight away into it, I think uh, when I was a youngster, uh, playing in the streets, things is all we had a. I lived over a place called the Isle of Dogs. Um, we had a park that was the back of the. Uh, we lived in a prefab, and you could get through in straight into the um, park. And we'd all meet on days, and we would we just. I think just football was through my father and my grandfather, and you just sort of like took it on from there. And was there anyone that stood out in terms of that journey for you at a young age that inspired you to maybe have a career within the game? Is there anyone that you can reflect upon? I think when I was growing up, I I don't think there was anyone specifically. I I was very much in tune with Bobby Moore uh, and that Elka player. Uh, That was a little bit obviously older, but my dad come from West Ham and um, was at West Ham with him and I had an affiliation to West Ham. Um, And I think it was Arsenal as well. Um, But I would probably really, my first real recollections would be the 1970 World Cup. I can remember that vividly. Um, basically because it was the first time we had a colour TV. And I can remember watching the 70 World Cup and being transfixed from then and from then. And then it was just so well, I was at eight at the time. and it, I couldn't remember much about it, but I just can remember enjoying watching it. And then same as every kid at that age, we had a wall in front of the house, like up against a wall and then cricket or tennis in the summer and all the, kid, all the fellas would get over and into the, um, into, the, into the caged area and we'd play football. So it was just, a, I think it was just being involved in it. You mentioned obviously your upbringing um, in terms of you know working class environments. Do you think those values that you learned at a young age transferred into your career? Did you did you learn a lot from playing out on the streets and connecting with communities and bringing that into life? Yeah, one hundred percent. I think even now, funny enough, we went out um, a couple of we- a couple of days ago, and uh, it's from friends way back from then. They've stayed with me all, all my life, and um, people through, and that's all through football as well. We've had connections and. Um, and I think it, it does give you, it treats you, it does give you a certain upbringing and uh, the way you want to go about it. And I think it stayed with me all my life, through my dad and through the people he knew and people you've, you've met along the way. Can you remember your first opportunity within the game then? Can you reflect on that? Uh, as what, well, as going into a club? Yeah. I think, I think down about it, it used to be the old uh, South Eastern counties. So you'd play for your district. I was thought I got picked for my district and then, uh, you just play for you and there'd be clubs coming along and Arsenal used to go to training and I think my, 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 my dad kept me back until 14, which I think was the right age where everyone was going. I was fortunate enough with Malcolm, Malcolm Fiji to go up to Manchester United or went up to Manchester, went into Arsenal um, uh, and it, you'd go to trials and you, they'd invite you in and if you did well, they'd take you on to the next level um, and then you end up coming down to a few clubs. I was lucky enough to go. I got selected for in the London and the south of England England schoolboys, and then from then, I think you because you was in that Elka player, you sort of like. Um, I never really went to more than um, only a couple of clubs, and Crystal Palace has always looked like it was going to be the one for me. I think again, it was a connection with Crystal Palace that I've been brought up. Then my dad was working there again, uh, and the players that they had, and that came from Malcolm Allison, and I think the way he, uh, I think the way they really um, set up the. The, the school was at Palace. It was the best players working with the best, getting the best coaches in. And he had a pathway. They call it a pathway now. It was a way getting into the first team. You had a manager, Terry Venables, who was very much... And that stuck with me right through my career of as I've um, gone on through the game and into a plan, not playing as much as I hoped, expected. But then again, I've gone into coaching and had a, a wonderful career through coaching. And I've kept that way through my philosophy through development of players now, and I've been very fortunate. Um, started off at uh, Charlton with uh, Alan Kirby. I was given the chance there, um, and his, their philosophy was young players. I moved into Arsenal, mm-hmm. and Arsenal, you know, it's, it's 
as a manager sticks with me so vividly that um he we had this academy uh that he've we've spent time and we spent uh financial situation we and the manager had a right to put the players give the players a chance albeit that obviously they've got to be good enough and that was that was what the acid test was and uh, their development through the years and i think we we um we we, we produced some groups of really good players that uh, went on for us and that was the way that stuck with me from when i first started playing as a kid and when i'm on crystal palace so it, it, i think that way is always with me right the way through we'll talk about obviously your coaching experience at arsenal uh rangers and a range of other football clubs in a moment but i just want to ask you around maybe the evolution of the game since you played and you mentioned those experiences at Crystal Palace, etc. How have you seen the game change? Is, is there anything that stands out in terms of the development of the game and how it's maybe changed your perception of of how you coach and how you develop players? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I thought about that a lot. Um, I've been extremely fortunate uh, through playing and actual uh, the people I've been around uh, was really, really forward-thinking. Um, and it all stemmed from Crystal Palace, from Malcolm Allison, and through Terry Venables and the way they set up their academy and uh, and the way they wanted to play the game. Uh, you know, a high level technical game, physically game, demanding. Um, and I think them things, uh, them that highlights that the game for me hasn't changed that so much. I, th- I think there's been obviously it's got quicker and faster, but the fundamentals of the game are the way you wanted to develop your young players, um, tried and tested way. Uh, you had the best players working with the best players, and the game teaches itself. You're you're guiding them through it, and uh, I think that way um, has I think actual development of players um, hasn't really for me hasn't all that much because I came through that system at Crystal Palace. I was extremely fortunate, um, and then got, taking that on to somewhat with Liam Brady at Arsenal, uh, it was always you play the game how, how he wanted the game to be played through Arsenal Wenger and and the way they wanted to develop their young uh, their players. It's been a um, it's just been a process of continuization all the way through. Uh, what I'd say it's changed. I think obviously the dynamics of the game has changed. The pace of the game has changed. Um, but I look back at the players that I was fortunate to be around at the time. And you're looking about Kenny Sanson, Brian Robson. Uh, these tried, uh, uh, there was a Derek Statham, a left back at uh, West Bromwich Albion. These people now, they was far in front of the game for me. Technically, it's really, really good players. Vincey Lair, Billy Gilbert, Jerry Murphy, that, that was the old card I was brought up with. Um, and the way that Terry Venables actually work with the young players and um, and the dynamics that come around young players and the enthusiasm that young players bring. And I think that's, st- that's kept with me for my whole coaching, um, my own coaching, for the, my own coaching journey so far. You mentioned Terry Venables and the other senior members that you, you've kind of worked with or, or, or observed and looked at. What what things did you learn from those individuals? Is there anything that you t- you took from from observing their practices or observing their behaviours that you thought, okay, that's a true value to what I want to do with my career? I think I think that I think the um, one of the biggest things that I've learned uh, looking back at the time you don't see it, is their man management and how to and how to deal with players. Um, and I think that um, being in that position now, I think you it's just not on the grass. It's they was. They were nice people as well, um, and they would help you. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we've had. We had at Arsenal it wasn't it wasn't just producing players. Our first and foremost, we, we have them from a young age, and we felt that we had a right to de- make them good, good, good guys as well. And um, I recently got a call at Christmas from it was Jay Boothro, Johnny Alls, um, David Noble, um, David Bentley, all ringing me up, and they're all together and. That's part of it that they've we've grown friendships, and for me, that's that's something that's that comes through um, the actual uh, development of friendship, uh, and, and I think it's a big part of uh, relationships in building building um, building real good academies. You mentioned obviously your opportunity going into coaching. You mentioned Charlton. What experience did you learn from working with the likes of Alan Kirbishley and and working in obviously uh, the surrounding areas? And knowing London yourself personally, is there anything that you learned during that that time that has maybe refined your outlook towards the coaching world and how that's bettered you as an individual? Mm, I think I think it was just a, again it was a, it was a real good environment to go and work. You wanted to go to work, and um, we had again Alan Kirby, Steve Britt, and then Steve left, and Alan took over, and um, and again it was um, 
it was a my first real foray into the development side of it and the young players that we had Lee Bowyer Jermaine Defoe who went on to West Ham we had Scott Parker again and even Mickey Bill who I get to work with again we go full circle and he's my boss in the end but there was enjoyment there was fun there was laughter you know and they was good players and they worked one another and it, it also worked you as a coach you 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 was always developing I think subconsciously and you look back in how do how you say that I think I suppose as young coaches now you've got to just work with the best you can work with because they would develop you as coaches the players are like a, a sponge they want information all the time and as a coach you've got to make sure that you've got that next level that um and I think there was a lot more individual work I think sometimes it gets a bit sanitized now with team shape and development teams it's but development's about developing individuals for the team and they've got to have the team to play but there was I think there was a lot more individual work done there we would work we had some coaches we would work with individuals and develop them for the team the team's just a vehicle for them to actually show that they are developing in the right way to go into the first team and you mentioned obviously the likes of Kerbishley who had a longevity at Charlton and even yourself looking at your career is there anything that you think is important to have consistent longevity within coaching is there anything that you think is important to you for listeners and viewers that might be interested in having a career within the game or even in sport as a whole that you think is important to ensure that you have that continuous development and that learning to to stay relatively contemporary and relatively inspiring to others yeah I think yeah I think as an individual I think you I think when you're working with managers and I think one thing they've got they've got to have trust in you and I've wrote down at what is trust and loyalty and belief and they they know that you're going to do the right right work for them and you're going to be they can trust you. You got you you have good um, you are actually good morally as well. You're a good person, and they trust you to do the work for them. Um, and that for me is a big part of of a coach is a, is a trust that the manager had in his staff, um, and how that comes that comes in all different shapes shapes and ways. And for me, that's one of the biggest things I felt that Alan trusted uh, us as academy. He saw us working, and we had that that and the, and the staff under under me at Charlton, we all they all had the trust in what we were doing was the right way for, for Charlton. Because indirectly a lot of players come through at the time. I think we was a little bit fortunate because Charlton had to play some young players. Um, and some players took the took the grass that grassed it and, and went on had a really good careers. But then alongside that we had Scott Parker, Paul Conchesti, Jermaine Defoe went on to West Ham. You know, we had some uh, Johnny Fortune. We had some really good players that again that was built that wasn't just a that wasn't just something that worked. It was actually put in place um, we had technical meetings and it, they call them technical meetings now, but we would sit down football meetings and put the groups together, even at Charlton. But it was, again, along with good recruitment and we all worked together. It was a good place to work. It's interesting because obviously since obviously that era, Charlton have kind of gone down the league. Do you ever look at that club and feel sad or do you let yourself get emotionally attached to, to, to the club? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I think I think when you're working, I think that's the... Well, maybe it's me, I, you do put a lot of emotion into your job. You know, you, it's just not a job. It's uh, And you look back at Charlton and Arsenal and Cuban Bars Rangers and even Rangers where we've just left it. Um, but the, the I think the early part of the, your career, you look back and you've got a lot of emotion with it because you're growing at the same time and you're seeing the club grow and you follow it the whole way and to see where it where it is now, it's still a great club and it's got so much potential and you, you hope that they do build it, uh, turn it around again. So obviously that shift going into Arsenal, different um, outlook in terms of what they're trying to achieve, different aspirations in, in comparison to maybe Charlton, you know, big European football club, big expectations. How was that for you in terms of that move and that development to, to maybe shift your mindset into more of an, an elite environment and, you know, prepare for that? Yeah. I think, of, again, very fortunate. <clears throat> Liam Brady gets a job. Uh, and he invites me in to take uh, take the under seventeens, and you fall into people like Don Howe. Don Howe was coming. Don Givens was the under nineteen manager. So the people you're around are football people. Arsene It was so we'd have talks, and it was I'm sitting in the room with Liam Brady, Don Howe, Don Givens, Arsene Wenger. You can't not learn from them, and they just football people. It's all football, football, and you grow with it. You're getting that every day of your life for your your first ten years. I don't think you really know what you're taking on. I think the one of the biggest things was the standards, just not on the pitch, off the pitch. Um, and they're driven to make good people again, you know, not just uh, good young men, 
um, and nice, nice people. And that was one of the, well, I think one of the right through my career, I've been that way, but the actual standards and the commitment to hard work um, and keep it's just a way that I think it's ingrained in you now. And I think being at Arsenal for such a long length of time, it was the your, your quality of work, uh, you're dedicated to your work and having people that believed in you as well. Did you have to maybe refine who you were as a coach? Obviously, you mentioned Wenger and maybe the new ideas that were brought into to the game at that time. Did that actually challenge you and make you think differently about the game? At 100%. Yeah, I think you, um, Arsene comes in and at the time they went Arsene who? Um, and uh, he showed them what he was all about and the way he thought about the game. But again, he was he was just, he'd come down and even some evening training sessions, if he was at the stadium, the old Ivory would be around. But Liam Brady was fantastic and the way he's out look on that, the quality of what he wanted from his players and how to play the game that they wanted. But when you went into Arsenal, you wasn't just now producing a football a footballer. You're producing a footballer that wants to win the league, wants to win the cup, wants to be in Europe. They was, again, it, it was ratcheting up year after year after year. And again, one of the, the, the biggest things that we felt was that it was the group, the quality of the group or the standard of the group affects the quality of your work that you can give them. And that when the group was high and we'd push groups together and we'd, we'd form and we'd push them through, again, individual work uh, and opportunities to go and play as well. And I think it's been, I think it was truly successful the period we had um, at Arsenal. But again, we had Liam Brady, David Court, Bobby Arbor, Stevie Bowl, bless him, Dermot Drummond, great, Carl Lamb, great football people, you know, and it was a, like a, it was like a football university and we was all striving for the same thing. There was no, um, and that for me, and even now we're still we're still friends and we still talk regularly, uh, and it, it's lasted a lifetime. Where do you think that culture comes from then, in terms of differences to other football clubs? Is it the people, or is it the, the standard set, or is it the environment? I'm just intrigued on how that winning mentality comes about. I think the first, I think the three, I think the three things you mentioned there, they are the main. What you mentioned, what you just spoke about, they are the a lot of the ingredients to a successful a successful football. Uh, winning again, I think we get back on winning and there was a period of time that winning was, or oh, you can't mention winning in an academy, but for me, winning is part of becoming a footballer. Um, and, at young, and at an age when you're developing and you've got to develop winners, you know, for me anyway, because um, I think kids in it, they go and play two games, they want to win. It doesn't, it shouldn't override what the work you're doing, but it's a big part of becoming a professional a, a footballer. The first thing when you go, is he a winner? Well, how do you know a winner? <laughs> Nines, tens, elevens, twelve. We don't. He we, we wasn't really speaking about winning. You were just harvesting it and growing it because you could see it for you. Um, and then all of a sudden you say to him, "Well, fourteen when you will start some out now winning." Well, I think you've just got to do it in the nice way where the young lads they don't see it happening, but it, you're you're doing it and subconsciously. It's seeping in. Have little races. I oh, do you want to win? And you'd always put someone with someone. You wouldn't. So they would win, and he so they'd strive against one another. And I think if you see. See the way that I think if you look at things, you um, you see books that have I've read loads of books where you work in they've got always you stretch them and you make sure they're outside that they can actually attain what you're trying to achieve. And even with any if you if you put someone who's just a skill race and he's a bit better, and then next one well you've got to beat him and he beats him and they work one another. He works hand in glove. I think I don't earn it for me anymore. And what did you learn from the likes of Wenger? Then is there anything that stands out on that experience that you learned from a from a leadership point of view, a winning point of view, but also maybe a cultural point of view, obviously being from France and experiencing these other countries in Japan and bringing that into Arsenal. Is there anything that you think stands out on your time on reflection of, of working with such a person? Yeah, I think Arsenal's, Arsenal's uh, character is, I think he, he's, he's French, but he's German as well, Strasbourg. <laughs> he, he's got the, he's got the both swords. He's got the, he's got the grit and, and French have as well without that. And he, and then he had the flair that he wanted to play it. Um, in but in the right way uh, and enjoying their football and developing them and sometimes you have to take two don't be so um, it wasn't built in a day take sometimes you've got to, sometimes you've got to recognise that they might have to come back a little bit to go forward and um, he was very very open and he worked in Japan that I think had a big influence on the way that he worked and taking all this in from Arsenal it was then trans transferred into the development of the young, younger generation through Liam Brady. So I think that way from Arsenal, I think if I could take anything from him, is his belief in the work that he did um, and also his patience with developing young players. 
did that reflect upon you, Neil, as well, in terms of being patient and thinking about the development of yourself in relation to the players? Obviously, you've been a coach and working in environment. Did that kind of intertwine with you in in terms of you, you progressing as a coach? Yeah, yeah. I think you, you, as you're developing as a coach, I think you um, when you're developing players and you're developing, I don't think you was just. I think when you're coaching every day, you're crossing that white line. I, I say to the fellas now when I speak to them, the more you can cross a black white line and get on the field and you're coaching you're coaching the players and you, you can't t- overtake the session it's got to be a ways about the players I think that was what come through us and it was the players we're there to um, facilitate the players and, and to work on their ways that's going to get them to where they want to go uh, and create on their careers and give them careers in the game and I think if you're honest and, and I think as you said trust is a big trust relationship honesty and I think if you can build this relationship with your with your players, you can, yeah, you, and you're honest with them where you think they'll go. One or two have surprised you, but you've given them a career. And I think along the way, I think overall we've been extremely successful with what we've achieved with our estimations on our players. I think the lads like Jack Wilshire, Seth Fabregas, Robbie Van Persie, uh, they walk in and you can see straight away they're going to be uh, they're going to be A players for Arsenal. You can you can see it. And then you lots so of like Luke Ailey, uh Jay Boothroyd. Uh, uh, even uh, Ben Chorley's and then you, uh, David Bentley's, you can Sebastian Larson's for Bruce Mwamba. So they are they are all spread out all over Europe and the world, uh, all over Europe and the world. They've had great careers and the ones come the last group that we was involved with at Arsenal, we developed a side that had every one of them and now playing in the football league. So it was a great success from the club for the club. But again, that was sat down and thought out years before it actually bared its fruit. And in terms of that process of sitting down and of thinking it out and being patient with players and maybe being surprised with players, what, what are you looking for within the development of individuals? Is there anything that you think is relevant to ensure that they have progression to, to go on and have careers within the game? Because obviously there's a range of different facets, technically, tactically, behavioural. I'm just interested on what you look for in terms of a development coach to ensure that they have that opportunity. Again, Again, what you've just mentioned there, I, I think sometimes that when you're a younger coach, you get in and you say, well, get his players, he looks good on a player and he, he does a skill, he's got a... But they've all got their own, we used to say, they've all got their own skill sets. They've all, they've all got their own marker that raises them above the level. And that's what we looked at uh, when we was at Arsenal. We would... Be, and I, I couldn't see everything, and, but you're not... It's a word I think they say, omnipotent, where you can see every... I'm not... I don't see everything, but so we... We had a round table where all the coaches would sit down, all the groups, the, the head coaches, and we would talk about individuals. And if someone come up with something, a lot of really, he's got this, it's a body, his, his character or his tackling or his pace or his ability to cross the ball or his dribbling ability or defending ability or his power. All these were in the melting pot. And then, then they had that. But what we did say to we got to have something that raises the bar, that raises him above the knob. And if they did that, then I think everyone that we looked at had that uh, individual character that would make him a player. And I think that was the one thing we looked at of all the players that we dealt with. Uh, that, uh, that um, And one or two would slip through the net. Of course they do. It's only normal. Uh, but I think the majority of times we were quite successful on the way we saw players and viewed players. And everyone has, as I said, uh, their skill set or their bit that brings to the team. And then it makes a hole and then where you go. You mentioned players such as Seb Larson, Fabrice Wamba. Obviously, that transition going into to the first team or even getting loan experiences at the likes of, I think it was Birmingham, Bolton, they, they went out on loan. What, 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 what is the difference in that, in that transition, obviously going from maybe academy football or under-21s or 23s football into to maybe first team football? Is there anything that you advise players to maybe consider going into a, 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 a first team environment where they may be on loan and they have to maybe consider different variables in this different environment? I think at the time, we was very fortunate because the last group that I was, we had a, uh, it was a, it was called the Premier League, I'm sure it was called the Premier League 2, it was like the old Reserve League. Um, so them, them, them kind of, Seb and Fabrice and Nicholas Bentner as well, we went to Burke and I think um, they were in that side that we used to uh, travel around the country and have some senior players involved. It, it was an excellent league. And it was a real competitive league. I do sometimes look at the games now, and I feel it's been diluted, and it's and it's more like a youth team, the under twenty threes. And 
I think you lose that little bit of edge and that little, that little bit of competitiveness in with senior players, which I think is vital to when you look at a top under 23 game and then you go and look at a first division game, the second division game, the competitiveness and the, um, and the desire because they're all working on different aspects of, to, to win, trying to win the game. I think it has, it has maybe a, it has, it has, but then saying that, the group we've got now in the England team have all come through that system, but they've gone out and low. Some haven't. I think you look at the boy Foden at Man City, he stayed in Man City and with Pep Guardiola, look at the players he's training with. You know, so there's all different roles to becoming a, a, a top player. But then you look at John, John Stone's come from Barnsley and there he's doing fantastically well at, at Manchester City winning the European Cup. And uh, Carl Walker, who came from uh, Sheffield United, now probably one of the best right backs we've had. Um, that I can remember, you know. Uh, so, um, getting back to your your original question, I think it's it's I think it's a good education from where you're going into. I think it's vital in your development where you go. And again, I think that's that. I think that's becoming an area of now of growth within the game of the loan manager because it's not just getting them out on loan. There, it's going to the right club. Where do you want to go to? Who do you want to go? Where do you want to go and play? But I think just going to play sometimes is a is a next level in itself. Um, we used to send some of the players out, and at times when they thought they were good players, and uh, we said no, because for me, if you're being, if you're a, a first division player, you're a good footballer, you're a professional footballer. And we used to some of them sometimes at times you just look down at them, well, I'm going to play somewhere, and we said no, go on, and I said because they're good players, and then you will realise when you're there, you, and they should come back and they say to me, you know, they could play, but there's just different levels within levels, and. You know, but if you're in the first division, second, you're a good, good footballer. Obviously, when you get right up to the tree, it's a different level again, you know. And they, I think they respected going out on loan and respected the players they were playing with. I suppose, I suppose in that sense, is maybe dropping ego and coming out of your comfort zone to apply yourself in a different environment where there might be a relegation battle or trying to win the league. You mentioned Birmingham and Steve Bruce. Yeah. 100%. I wanna, and you're going in some... I think we were a little bit fortunate at Arsenal, but I think if when we was... At, Queen's Park Rangers and then they're going back out we were going out and we was going when we was at Arsenal you'd have championship clubs coming in for them and it was the start of going to Europe on loan and you're going to big clubs as well so you're going into top top clubs that are going to be tra- uh, uh, challenging for promotion or to get as high as they can in the league but when you was at QPR and then you were going out and on Lee and lower first division clubs and the, the dynamics between the players of some are saying They've got their wage, and if their bonus, if their bonus, if their bonuses could double their wages, come Saturday they're they're flying in, you know. So there was a different, there was different um, analysis on the players that you're playing with and the club where you go, and you put players to where you think that they needed development. The, it wasn't just right. You're going to go there. Well, is it okay to go there? First and foremost, I think going out alone is a great thing. You, know, you go and start with first team. That's your first, and then if you can, you then start to say okay. Well, no, I think he might be better to go in for that club because it might suit that kind of plan. It's interesting how you said there's a strategy to it, but also obviously the agent is probably trying to get something out of it as well. And, and, and it's interesting how that works. Yeah, so I've got to, yeah, I, I, th- I think they have. I think now, I, obviously, I, I speak a lot with agents. And what I've found there is now that yeah, the agents there are very, very, um, they understand it. And now are actually saying, it's right, well, that's not the right club for him to go to. Uh, agents are getting their club, their, some of their players to do pre-season, pre-season. So there's some good work going on with their agency, uh, some agents as well. They're looking after their players. There's a lot more care, I think, from um, the agents that I've spoke to. They care, really care about their players, which is a great thing, I, I think. As well. When years gone by, it's been a bit, they've been used a little bit as cattle for them, if I'm honest. I think so. There has been a general uh, uplift for me with their agents, with their working with their players. How do you develop yourself then going into an environment where you might have been working with, you know, academy players and then all of a sudden you're with, you know, the likes of Fabregas, Van Persie, these, you know, elite world-class footballers. What's that transition like for you when you're going into that environment to, to coach and get the best out of them? Is there anything that you've come across on your experience? And it might not be Arsenal, you mentioned QPR and Rangers, obviously coaching first team in comparison to maybe other levels. Is there any... Is there anything that you can share in terms of in terms of that and, and, and the relevance of it? I think the more I've the more I've um, been involved with first team, and the more I've worked with senior players, it's it's actually um, coaching on the pitch becomes I wouldn't say so much secondary, but it's your relationships and you do a lot of your work off the field, um, having chats, having talks. There's so much now 
that's coming into the into the into the game, the data analysis, where you can sit down and have ones for ones and actually speak through what you're seeing. And I think the players nowadays are they grow, they've grown so much with their own. They've got their own mind and their own thoughts. Where before it was mm, keep your mouth shut, get on with it. This is what your coach doing. It, it was a little bit coach driven. I, I think now, which is a great thing for the club, the young players are asking now, well, why? What have I got to do that? What have I? So I think that I think the areas that have really come forward is I'm, I've using them ever so much now with the with the data when you're working with. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with um, the Rangers and Mike and set it up where we had units. So I was in charge of the defensive units, and you're talking to people like. James Tavernier, Connor Goldston, um, Laura Varisic, that top, top players, you know, all the legend, um, legend in Rangers and uh, famous. So you'd have man-to-man conversations and, and they would discuss areas and you would show them and in the end they're going out and they're agreeing before they've even gone out. Because sometimes years ago when you're going on the pitch, you've got, they go, mm, hold on, no, why, I don't agree. You could have a confrontation. But now I think it's more, uh, it's more, it's more managed better the with a player, with the player management and coach, I think it's a much more better relationship. It's more objective rather than subjective, then, because you've got evidence to one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Does that inform your practice? Maybe training, etc. Does that make life easier for you? I think it does because I think you, when you go and when you set up, you you don't just uh, rock up to the training and say, right, what do we fancy doing today? I think it's oh, we do it a bit. No, 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 no. You work. You're working on where you see you want to develop your team. You might need to do a bit of improvement in certain areas or a facet of the game you're not happy with, you're then actually sitting down and you're working your your actual training session specifically into what you're going to be doing. And then you discuss it with the players. So before you go out, you, you actually have a you have a talk with the players and also some individuals. You might need to branch off and take some individuals and do some specific work. And it's more actually thought out. The process is a lot more thought out for. And I think the players are really, uh, um, they really welcome this way of thinking. In terms of obviously your experience, and you mentioned QPR and then obviously Rangers, two different football clubs in its way. Obviously, Rangers is very much on winning and European competitions. QPR might be trying to get promotion or bring stability within the championship. How, how do you fluctuate between you know the mindset of the individual coaches or the individual players that you work with to ensure that you are going into an environment to, to ensure that those values are installed? Is there anything that you, you might share upon? Because obviously... They're different and unique in their own way, but obviously you have to adapt yeah. to fit the the objectives of the football club. Yeah, I think uh, so I think objectively, I think you what you mentioned there. Every every game is about winning. Once you're in the first team, no matter what they say, it's about winning, getting that result for your team. Um, and I think going from obviously the size of Rangers and then the Q, QPR, they were still they wanted to win in their own. They've got to win their own games, um, and I think. Um, that's the key. One of the key points is how do you get your team to um, get on a winning or to keep winning, keep the winning run going, uh, not have too many losses. Um, you build the winning factor within your team, and that I think that's a, a big growth area for when you when you're actually sitting down and building your team. You, uh, the winning on a Saturday, the winning on a on a every match. You that's what we're all about, and I think that makes you the kind of character that you are, and it's that mentality that you've got to deal with. The winning factor doesn't change by the size of the club. It's still the same. Um, the, the other, the size of the club is irrespective of when you walk across that grass. You want to win every game you're in. Uh, and I think it's about how, to, how you achieve your goals. Uh, again, your estimations of what you've got for your club to get them as good as they can get. And in hindsight, you mentioned Rangers. Is there anything that you may have reflected upon differently? Because obviously, coming to the end of that period, you know, winning results wasn't necessarily... Uh, at its best at, at the club uh, is there anything that you might have done differently just on reflection I'm just interested on that no I think no no I've got to I've uh, looking back I think you, you look back at the players that we brought into the club I think I think when you had so many changeovers I think that I think that the results the second part of the, the, the first half of this, when we went in there the first the first season it went flyingly well it went really really well um, and then we've Michael, we the, the club was changing, and we built a lot of players in into the club. I think the chairman changed, the CEO changed, a new management actually his group. So when you get that influx of change within a club, it, it's very very seldom does you find that um, it runs smoothly. I think even Chelsea now you're looking at Chelsea, but they will come good because of the quality they've got inside and the work that the manager's doing with them. And I think 
um, the success they're having at the moment is due to the work that was put in place by uh, the staff that were there at the time. Um, and is, you're always going to have teething problems. I think if you, when you're doing it a long time, you, you've just got to get, but as long as you know where you're going, you've got your vision of the work you want to do. We always thought that as a group, that this group of players will be successful um, uh, and narrow the gap to, let's not forget Celtic have won three trebles. So they're a good side. Uh, and it was always going to take some time to bridge that gap and overtake it and sustain success. Um, and that's, that's I think getting back to Arsenal, that was where we had at Arsenal, sustained success. It wasn't just a, a flash in the pan. It just wasn't on one side. All. It wasn't because before Arsenal went, I think Arsenal won the Cup, the league, and they hadn't had a success with getting into Europe every year. And Arsenal said that from when he was there. I think you're seeing that. How, how hard it is to, to get into the Champions League. And I think that's, that's the, the you've, I think you've always got to have a vision of where you want to go and what you're working towards. And that's what we were, we were doing at Rangers. And unfortunately for circumstances, it wasn't to be. And you move on and onto your next, uh, um, hopefully onto your next, um, your role within the club. Do you think that's the hardest part within, uh, whilst working for Rangers is that demand and the pressure. And obviously the neighbours are Celtic and either one or either top or second and second's last in that league I think personally but do you think that's the hardest part because of what the opposition's doing and, and obviously being patient and the demand that a club such as Rangers can can challenge that process I think I think as you say uh, coming second to, uh, second in Rangers to, to sell is his last but I think you've got to see where Rangers have come from their history over the last or uh, 10 years their last decade where they went to and where they were coming back from um, and I think they will go over them again and they will they will I think it's great competitive between the two clubs and it drives one another on um, but I think when you've come from Arsenal and you're living every day for 21 years of this uh, you live in a bubble but it's a success you've got to be a top four club and I think any wherever you go Celtic I uh, Rangers I enjoyed this, my time at Scott and it was fantastic I enjoyed the club I met some wonderful people uh, and I really enjoyed the the actual football up in Scotland, um, um, but I think having having the experience of Ars- Arsenal all them years, it was it, it held you in good stead for where you were going into the Rangers. And but Arsenal was a phenomenal place to be for a period of time. For the length I was there, and uh, what what was achieved by everyone at the club was uh, I look back and um, it was a fantastic era for the club. I feel. Did did you, did anything surprise you in terms of the league within Scotland in in, in terms of representing Rangers because I, I get the impression that people f- from the South kind of snub their nose at the Scottish League and I'm just interested on is there anything that I agree uh, I agree 100% I agree 100% what you're saying we, we used to go to games and every team is their cup font so that it's like the era when you get the fixtures yeah. come out here and you, you're um, the first team you look for is the Celtic and Rangers games and the, the, it would be a full house everyone would be excited players get a lift they all of a sudden they find ten percent. It was a every game we had was a was a hard fought game up in Scotland physically, um, and you had to overcome that uh, that test every game. Uh, and I felt we did, and we were on our way. And um, as we said, it just wasn't to be at the time. And um, but the work was definitely put into place there for uh, sustained success. I think. How did you find maybe European competitions in in that transition? Because obviously you've, you mentioned your academy um, opportunities and then making your way. Uh, you know, at Arsenal, QPR, Rangers, and then all of a sudden you're in the European competitions where it's the best of the best. How did you find that in terms of preparation and coaching? Uh, European game was great. Yeah, I, was, uh, I was really fortunate. Again, um, we had uh, Arsenal, Arsenal had Pat Rice. He had two lieutenants like before Steve Bold. He had Pat Rice and he had a, uh, uh, a chap called uh, Bora Primorak, who was a Yugoslavian uh, captain when uh, Croatia went, it was Yugoslavia. And I learned so much of his mentality off of off of Bora, and I think um, you do look and look at the game differently, and the way they develop the game, and they want the game to be played. Europeans, it, it's it's a different, it's a def- definitely a different style. And they took they take they took it into Europe, didn't get to the didn't get to the summit and win the Champions League, but we got close. Um, so the the way the game was played and the old European experience was was something that I've I've got so many memories and treasures. And what is the most important lesson that you've learned, maybe on reflection of your career, Neil? Is there anything that stands out that's maybe really inspired you to have this continuous longevity within the game and striving to improve or 
striving to want to support and develop individuals, whether that's players, coaches. Is there anything that stands out in terms of what you've really took on in terms of a lesson learned on your journey? I think the lesson that I've, I've learned is to, I think as a coach, I think you've always got to be honest. Honest and and, and I make no bones about being hard and, and demand the demands you put on individuals. I think you've got to understand who you're working with and what kind of demands you can put on these individuals and how much they can take. Uh, they call it bandwidth. They'll, you know, at the moment, how much they can take on and if you push them too, Mark, and you break them. But I think, I think, it, I think working with young players is, a, is an energy for me. It gives me life. It gives me that to see uh, players coming through and playing in the first team and, and having careers, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience from where I am now. I think I think the honesty side of it, and Arsene said to me, always be in touch with the top level of the game, always. And so even now, now I'm um, out of work at the moment and you're looking for your next next role, I, it's my self-time. So I do things where I'm trying to improve nil. Either. So you never stop at the moment. I'm I'm reading a book and it's a, it's a fantastic book. It's called The Trillion Dollar Coach. Um, and it's a wonderful read. Uh, and he came from um, Gridiron. And he's then went into Intuit, Google, Apple, the top, the, the way, and it's all about man management and managing teams within teams. Uh, and you can never stop learning about these things and, and trying to always, uh, it's nil time now, this period is not time where you sit down and feel sorry for you, right, I'm going to develop nil again. You're always developing yourself to, to obviously come back and, um, and work again and, and put something else into the game that you, uh, that you hope will benefit some other individual along the way. Do you think that's sometimes needed within the world of football? You mentioned your 21 years at Arsenal and obviously your other experiences. Fast-paced, intense, pressurised environments, high demand, unsociable hours. Do you feel like sometimes you appreciate the time that you have away just to reflect and you know recharge and go again? Yeah, I think you, I think you do because I think as well. You, you, I think you, um, I think you get. It's like you get. It's like a bubble. You get caught, caught up in it, and along the way, I've had three children, and now I've got grandchildren, and. I'm now really enjoying my grandchildren and it's a little bit, part of me is a bit, sometimes I look back and think, oh, I didn't really enjoy my, when my children were growing up, you know, and, uh, but that, at that period of time, you're, you're forward going, you're, you're enthusiastic. I've done never losing my enthusiasm. You're hungry and you're, you're pushing on and you're working for you, for everybody. And I think these times it, you come out of it and you reflect of what's gone on. And I was talking to my son the other day. He said, dad, you don't realize what you've achieved, what you've been in. All what we was listening to the radio the other day about what uh, the cups with uh, I think Martin Keown and everything he was talking. I was right there with it, and yeah, you look back at yourself and think what you've achieved and what you've done. But it, it's only that's only a spur to uh, move you on to the next to your 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 next job and the enthusiasm for the game and the enthusiasm for working. And um, I think that's a big part of being a, a, a coach is your enthusiasm for the game, and, and I think the players can feed off you and then. And they last for them. They laugh at me now. Some of the stories that come out, and they all laugh at me. But uh, you're enthusiastic. That's the way you are. And just on that, what is the proudest moment you've had as a coach on your journey? You mentioned the cops, etc. Is, is there anything that stands out? Uh, how do you? How do you? Um, I think as a team, winning the, I think winning the cups, and I think they were great. And I think being as a first team, um, being. I think being a first team coach, I think when you're looking and you're watching your team play, and um, a little bit selfish when you see them play and they see the work that you've put into them to win games. I think you take a self, a real pleasure in yourself, a warmness inside that says, "Yeah, what we're doing, they, they, they played well there, and the way the work we're doing with them." I think self gratification inside. I think actually seeing the players that you've worked with make careers and long and then long careers, and I think you then when they make their deb uh, debuts and. Um, you take a real, um, a real pleasure in seeing them succeed and have their own careers and grants and then their own families and then become good people. And, um, and, then, and I think there's all different uh, aspects of the, the way you see success and the way you, you take it on. I think they would be the areas that I'd be most, I'd get a really warm feeling. Excellent. And final question, Neil. I always ask my guests to kind of think about how they would like to be remembered. So if you were to maybe come to the end of your journey and you were to, to maybe reflect back on everything that you've done and everything that we've, we spoke about on this podcast today. 
what do you want to do in terms of maybe a legacy or anything that you would like to be remembered by in terms of what you've achieved and what you've done in terms of the world of sport? I think when you finally you pin your boots up or you're not on the grass or you're sitting back, I think you'd like to be remembered as a, a good, honest football man, you know, that was honest and knew his football, but a good football man and a good person, you know, did the right by people. Excellent. Leo, I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Obviously, uh, we've been talking over LinkedIn and there's a challenging time in terms of us arranging this. But I just want to say thank you for your insight and I'm sure it would be very valuable for, for listeners and viewers that might want to go into the world of coaching but also might have transferability. And what I mean by that is there might be people that are teachers, people that work in businesses that might be inspired by some of the values that you've said today and that can be applied in other practices. So I'm sure it would be very insightful for listeners. So. Once again, thank you and uh, good luck in the future, whatever it is that you uh, achieve to do. Listen, thank you very much for inviting me on. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope it helps someone along the way. Have a, a great hour. Thanks a lot.